are these people? What can we do here, in your opinion, to ensure the liberation of Palestinians? Hmm. Well, I mean, uh, it's a hard question because, uh, like we were saying earlier, in, in my opinion, it does um, boil down to supporting the resistance and really hammering home that their act of resistance is legal. Um, I mean, right. we're, we're, we're constantly being told, you know, uh, by Western media, Russia did this, Syria did that, and it's always actually not true. But they'll, they'll cite some sort of international law or something. Um, but the the right for Palestinians to resist their occupation is absolutely legal. So I think uh, I think a lot of people I think it's very important to keep reframing the narrative. Um, the lexicon is very important. So uh, you know, uh, obviously the, the use of the word terrorist to refer to resistance is is absolutely um, incorrect. Uh, and by the way, I, I do often make this point. So I'm sorry if I'm repeating it, but. Isn't it ironic how the West fomented the war on Syria, okay. armed Al-Qaeda, armed the original pre-Syrian army, armed all the different terrorist factions, um, enabled them to uh, commit heinous acts of terrorism against Syrian civilians from the very beginning, from 2011, very early on, um, and yet continued to call them rebels and support the right to resist the so-called evil regime, right? So you have literal al-Qaeda and affiliated terrorists that the West lauds as rebels and says they have the right to be armed, they have the right to commit the atrocities they've committed, and they blame the Syrian government, but then you have Palestinian resistance groups that are literally fighting for their lives, for the lives of Palestinians, and the West uses all the uh, obnoxious lexicon against them. So I think for I think for the average person that doesn't have time to consume media as we do, um, there is obviously a lot of deliberate confusion. So I, I do think it's important to reach people and, and uh, allow them to understand, number one, resistance are not terrorists. Number two, they have the legal international, internationally, under an international law, legal right to resist. Um, and then um, I think that just, well, you know, constantly checking as, as in correcting the media narratives. For example, again, we'll use Russia or Syria as an example. If the New York Times or the BBC or CNN or whomever, one of these, one of these rags was to report on alleged crime done by the Syrian government or by Russia, for example, they would be very clear who committed such alleged crime. Although in most, if not almost all, if not all cases, the, the alleged crimes they report are fabrications or uh, um, Obfus obfus I can't say that word today, Obviously. obfuscation, yeah, <laughs> of what the, the terrorists actually did. But when it comes to um, reporting on uh, Israel, their war crimes, their genocidal crimes in Gaza, they'll they'll remove the, uh, the perpetrator. They'll just say, Palestinians died. Oh, how mysterious. So I think it's also important to constantly, either in our own like uh, media work or simply on Twitter, X thingy, or in conversations with people, making it clear, like, the media are removing the perpetrator. Israel is removed. So it's not being hammered home. This Palestinian child had his head blown off by an Israeli bomb supplied by the West. It's just like, oh, the child mysteriously died amongst a bunch of tents for some reason, you know? So it's it's very important to keep um, correcting that narrative. Yeah, so, but I don't know. I mean, I also am not naive. Like, um, um, we know that the number of Palestinians who've been murdered by Israel since uh, 11 months ago is far, far higher than the estimate, the numbers that we're hearing reported. Yeah. There are numerous people that have spoken out about that. The Lancet, Dr. Mads Gilbert. Dr. Mads Gilbert, his estimate is horrific because it, it puts it up to nearly 500,000 or over 500,000. Right, right. Including people who will die from the conditions Israel has created, which is why I always do go back to my experiences because I wanted I want to point out like these are not new conditions. Okay, some of the conditions now in Gaza are new in terms of like certain um uh diseases that are spreading, skin diseases or whatever, but the overall conditions of uh destroying the water and all the infrastructure and yeah. creating, you know, uh the the sort of uh, food uh, borne illnesses like anemia or diabetes or et cetera stunted growth in children. Well, that's we talked all about old. That's all. Vanessa Bealey's reporting from Ilan Pap about 
typhoid being put in water and you know i mean it's just like i mean i war crimes for decades practically so you yeah, know right. but yeah. we've yeah. we've talked i've talked because i've spent significant time in sub-saharan africa and having experienced visiting rwanda and seeing the after effects of their genocide there right. and how the west essentially turned a blind eye to that until they couldn't anymore by then almost a million Rwandans died so i kind of wonder like what is the number that becomes very indefensible for the west to actually turn to palestine and say okay we actually have to do something now so so yeah i do agree that they are misnumbering the deaths on purpose because yeah. they don't want people to see they don't want people to feel that kind of connection mm -hmm. that oh that's a lot yeah. you know right. but we had that same but it, we did but 911 just passed 3000 people died there and that that well relatively was, was less enough. but people felt an attachment to that yeah so take more than eye for so eye for me, so right so and also in Syria, if you recall, like there was, you know, every time an area was going to be liberated, first it was Aleppo, well, before, there was Homs before that, et cetera. But for yeah. example, 2016, throughout 2016, the war propaganda was off the charts regarding Aleppo. Last doctor, last hospital, last cat, last clown, last whatever, right? right. And also like just to totally um, whitewashing the crimes of the terrorist groups against the Syrian civilians in Aleppo. Um, but it's the same in Eastern Ghouta, et cetera. But what I noticed too was that the UN, of course, was going along with it. So, for example, when they talk about Aleppo under siege or East Ghouta up, uh, under siege, they'd inflate the numbers by double or triple. Right. So, when Aleppo was finally liberated, now I, I don't remember the the number. Let's I, I'm I'm just making an example because I don't actually remember the number at this point. It's a while back now. But I believe the UN was saying 300, for example, 300,000 Syrians civilians trapped in eastern um, Aleppo, for example. And when when Aleppo was liberated and the terrorists uh, who people who wanted to stay stayed, people who wanted to leave were given safe passage to Idlib. The number was around 100,000 that were there. So hugely inflated. They did the same thing in Eastern Ghouta. So whereas they're downplaying the number of Palestinians slaughtered or starved by Israel, they would inflate the number of civilians, which they would attribute uh, the blame to the Syrian government, which, when in the end, actually, in every single case, the reason they were starving in Aleppo or Eastern Ghouta or Madaya or Luar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, was because the terrorists were taking the food that did enter and then they weren't giving it to the civilians. So right. anyway, this is just as highlight the point of how numbers are played with depending on what the narrative is.